That'd be seven. You obviously know the direction we're going today in our, our presentation. We're going to be looking at education. Um, this last Thursday night, some of you can go back online and check it out. Bay Berry had their graduation for the graduating class of 2020. And of course, uh, again, my congratulations to Bentley, Zhao, and Mia. I'm so thankful for the, the huge step that they have made at this time. I, I, I started out with a, a title. In fact, it's still on my, on my notes here. A History of Adventist Education. And then I realized, uh, who in the world do I think I am to think that I can give a history of Adventist education in an uh, hour and a half? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, and then I said, well, maybe I'll put the early history of Adventist education. And then I realized I was still outside my ballpark. So please have mercy on me. Uh, I, there was going to be some things that I have left out for the sake of time, but we're going to be looking at a broad overview of the beginnings of Seventh-day Adventist education. Um, yeah. When you type the phrase something better into Google, which is something that people do these days, um, you're going to find a myriad of different results. Uh, something better is actually a modern dance song. Some of you may have knew that. Uh, it happens to also be a gospel song, and it also happens to be a Muppet song. Um, but we're not talking about any of those today. Something better is also a website uh, that introduces others to Jesus and a website that tells you about healthy cooking. Something better is actually a word that was used to describe the female relief society of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Something better is also a website for finding adult friends and it's the name for a business specializing in decluttering and cleaning your homes and businesses. And finally, there's a natural foods company called Something Better and several movies. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're going to be looking at a statement that was written over 100 years ago. It uses the word something better. But before we do, do you mind if we just pray together real quick? Father in heaven, I ask, that as we go into this talk, uh, this message is a history, and at the same time, it's a history that I believe is of your work. I pray that you will give clear thinking to myself. Uh, may your words be heard. I pray in your name, amen. Something better is the watchword of education. The law of all true living, whatever Christ asks us to renounce, he offers in its stead something better. Written in a little book called Education, a little over about 120 years ago. Uh, fantastic. I brought this book up because this book is an incredible one. If you have not read this book and you're interested in education, you're missing out. Um, the first four chapters... Uh, I, I, it's never wise to suggest this, please, I don't, but the first four chapters are going to give you the whole philosophy. You read the first four chapters, you've got the book. The rest of it builds up in a very beautiful way. It's kind of like a book called Great Controversy, which I shared with you all about in the last couple months. Read the last 10 chapters. Be familiar with it. It gives you a picture of where we're at and what's going on. And so sometimes it's good to know what portions of books, because I know if you're like me, some of you see a book that's over a couple hundred pages, and you say, I don't know if I have the time for that right now. Well, here is uh, some good information. All right. The purpose of education is to provide those who are educated with something better. I know that was an astounding statement, but there it is. The purpose of education is to provide those who are educated with something better. Um, they should be better people with better skills, with better health and a better relationship with Jesus because of their education. Schooling of some kind has been around for a long time. In fact, um, I would say the first teachers, I, and I, I remember hearing Mrs. Wall share this last night. I guess I can call you Sherry here, right? Um, at our uh, at latter graduation a couple of nights ago, parents are the first teachers. And really, parents have been original teachers for thousands of years. Uh, the father taught the sons. The mother taught the daughters. And then if there was some kind of specialty of some kind, you went out and got trained in some special way. But your education, by and large, was done 
within your family. And that's how it started. Former schooling started coming around, oh, depending on which historian you're talking to, but 2,500 to 3,500 years ago. Uh, scribal societies started uh, having you train in specifics. As soon as you have a written language, you started having more formal schooling, it seemed like. Um, however, in Hebrew society, uh, and by the religious society, has also really promoted formal schooling. Hebrew society focused a lot on learning how to read the Bible. And so mothers taught the language of reading and writing to their children. And so that would be uh, something else that came around that time. However, education has morphed again until recent centuries. And what we have now is actually recent. You may not realize that, but the educational system as we look at it today has only been around for a couple hundred years. Uh, this corporate formal schooling that you and I uh, have in our society. There's a much to admire in the more recent developments of education. One of those things to admire is literacy rates are the highest that they probably have been in many places in a long time. However, in spite of literacy rates, when this was written 100 years ago, there was definitely a need, and I believe there still is a need for something better when it comes to education. Um, about 150 years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church rose to the challenge of something better. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? So I'm going to take some time. We're going to go through a history. Um, I am looking forward to history because I like history. Some of you who don't like history, I hope you didn't tune me out already. Hold on. Uh, we're going to try to interact, look at some questions, and see how it's relevant to us today. Okay, again, um, it's a history, not a philosophy. Uh, those of you who are longing for a philosophy of education, I'll throw in a few statements here and there, but the real issue we're looking at is, is history at this time. Uh, Writer C. Mervyn Maxwell in his book, Tell It to the World, says this, No other denomination does so much for its people as does the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I would like to agree. Um, he goes on to say this, Since 1852, it has provided youth publications now numbering scores around the world. Its Sabbath school, youth, and education departments exist largely or entirely for youth. And today it provides the largest Protestant system of elementary and secondary education in the world. Um, I had the privilege when I was in college of touring with a choir. And we went around the world. Uh, when I spent some time teaching with Amazing Facts, I had the privilege to go to some additional countries. And I can tell you, I find evidence schools everywhere I go. And it's awesome. It's fun to go into South America and see these hundreds of children at a Seventh-day Adventist school. And then you go to Romania and you see these children at a Seventh-day Adventist school. And you go into Hong Kong and you see children at a Seventh-day Adventist school. And you go to Malaysia and you see them at a Seventh-day Adventist school. You see the little small schools in Australia, little small schools here in the U.S., then the big schools. But where you go, there's Adventist education. It's spread around the world. What is it that made it something better? And what is it that we can learn from it today? Um, History, by the way, has to be relevant today or it's not worth listening to. Now, how would you like to have him as your teacher? He's a great guy, but the beard may be a little bit too impressive for some of you. Um, Mr. Santos, you should try it. No, no, you're not going to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I like to look at just a few people in this history, if you don't mind joining me. Pestaluzzo. He was a European living in Switzerland, and he had some incredible ideas about education. And his idea in education, one of his ideas, was that teachers needed to be trained. You may not realize this, but a lot of times teachers weren't trained. I think I've talked about with some of you this recently. Teachers, you would grab the smartest student who just graduated, and you'd have them come in, and they would teach the next year. Um, and I guess there is some, you know, advantages. They were just recently in there as a student. But you're missing out on some educational techniques and methods on reaching certain people. And so you didn't have always the best teachers. And so uh, Pestaluzzo said, we need to have trained teachers. Another thing he felt was needed is we need to have a balance of hand, head, and heart. We need to have what we, uh, I think sometimes in Adventist education, we need a threefold education or a balanced education, a holistic education. He was saying these things around the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s. Very important. Um, 
he felt that work is part of education. Now, <laughs> that's, that was something that any of you have been through an Adventist school system like myself, that's what it was. Work is part of your education. I had to work four hours a day when I was in academy. I had to work four hours a day when I was in college. And this was just part of education because education, remember, education is not simply taking the brain, opening it up, and pouring information in. That's, that's a misconception that we have sometimes. I remember to this day my introduction to teaching class in college. And the teacher drew a picture and now I'm on the other side of this, but he drew a picture of a head that was opened up with a picture of information pouring into the head. And he said, this is not education. He goes, this is preaching. Sorry. He was picking on preachers, and I was in the education department. Now I'm on the other side, and that's, uh, I, I have to pick on my own self. But that is education. Education is not giving information. Education is so that a person understands it and assimilates it and makes it part of them. And that's what Christian education is always aimed to do. And it takes the whole body, all of who you are. Well, there was some people in the 1830s here in the United States who wanted to do that, and they started a school called Oberlin College. Oberlin College was a Christian school. It wasn't Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist wasn't around yet. But they believed uh, that the Bible should be an education. They believed there should be a balance of the manual labor and academics. And it was the first school, college, in the United States that was co-ed. They were, they were cutting edge, if you can use that phrase. Um, they believed in vegetarianism. And they believed in temperance. And temperance in that time would be no what? No alcohol. That's correct. So this is the, the picture of Oberlin College. I'd like to share a statement. It's found in this book, Education, page 17. It says this. We need to train our youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other people's thoughts. And when we see people like Pestaluzzo and Oberlin, they were willing to do that. They were willing to say, we're not going to do what everyone else is doing. We're going to think outside the box and say, how can we make it better? Something better was their goal. And that is something, I think, is the foundation of all good education. Then the Sabbath school, Sunday school movement. Of course, you're familiar with Robert Rakes. Those of you who know history and like history started the Sunday school movement in England. It used to be that they didn't have Sunday school and we have here Sabbath school. Uh, what happened is you would come, listen to the church service, and then go. And there was not a focus on our, the youth. And there's a desperate need for us to focus on training young people. And the Sabbath school was set up for that. Uh, James White was the key pusher for that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Um, youth instructor was written. Uh, Sabbath school lessons for youth. There was a man by the name of Goodloe Bell. Well, actually, this is a picture of. Goodloe Bell is the first one to write Sabbath school quarterly for young people. Uh, Goodloe Bell was an interesting guy. I'll tell you his story. Now, let me tell you this, and we'll come back to Goodloe Bell. The first school, uh, other than Kevin, because we just talked about this, and you knew it before I told you, can anyone tell me who was the first Seventh-day Adventist church school teacher? You get bonus points if you get it, for whatever it happens to be. <laughs> bonus points for being at church, I don't know. Good guess, very good guess. Not Jane Andrews. It was a young lady. That was a good guess as well. She started in Bucks, Brit, Bucks, Bucks Ridge, New York, before the Adventist press moved from New York to Battle Creek, Michigan. Her father would become the first Seventh-day Adventist General Conference president. About as much clues as I can give. Her name is Martha Byington. She was, and by the way, our 5th through 8th graders, if any of you are watching right now, you know that because we learned that in our class. Martha Byington was the first Seventh-day Adventist teacher. Uh, there were schools that were started in New York, and basically they were in the people's homes. So you'd have several different families come to one home, and a, a person like Martha Byington would teach, and she kind of was the famous one, but there was other schools as well. Um, you know why they went to school? at a person's home with several different families? 
were schools Christian? Were public schools Christian at that time? Help me out. Were public schools Christian in the mid 1800s? Yes, they were very much so. In fact, your first primer, some people derogatorily have called it the New England Bible for youth. Uh, because it was, <laughs> the whole primer was about, I think A stood for Adam. Uh, and, and Z stood for, I forget what it was, that's bad. But um, the whole focus was to teach the Bible through the grammar, through the primer is what they called it. So why would you, why would an Adventist not send their children to a school that was decidedly Christian? Well, here's one of the reasons. In the 1850s, Adventists weren't really all that popular. In fact, people made fun of them. Didn't you think you were going someplace a few years back? You're still here. Obviously, something's wrong with you. And can you imagine children having to deal with that kind of... We, we know be, children can be tough on each other. And so what happened is that was one of the reasons was all the pressure that was coming in. We'll start our own school so that our children could be taught what the Bible teaches accurately and also not have to deal with the ridicule from other students. So that was one of the reasons. After um, that came in the gentleman on your screen, Mr. Goodloe Bell. Goodloe Bell went to a school that was very unique called Oberlin College. He had studied at Oberlin. He had become a teacher, and he had gone out and teaching, but one thing that he hadn't learned at Oberlin was about overwork, and he had worked himself really bad. And so Ober, uh, uh, excuse me, Goodloe, he was worn out, tired, and he went to Battle Creek, Michigan to a place called Western Health Reform Institute because they used to think that Michigan was the West. Now, we know better than that today, but that's what they thought then. And so they went to Western Health Reform Institute, and they were there in Western Health Reform Institute, and good little Bell heard that it was, he liked the word reform. He thought, man, this sounds like Oberlin, reform. And we got there, he was glad. Instead of giving him drugs, you know what they had him do? Go out and split wood, relax, and slowly build his strength back up. And he said, I like this. And he started liking the, the theology that he was hearing at Western Health Reform Institute. He said, this is good. Well, one day he was out splitting wood. As he was splitting wood, and you can see he's an uh, impressive looking man. And as he was splitting wood there, all of a sudden, some boys stopped by who were teenagers, and they were going to work at the Review. That was the, the, the magazine that was being put out by the church at that time. Actually, we still put it out. And they were going, and he was watching, uh, these boys are watching him split, and one of them was a guy by the name of Edson. His last name was White. And Edson watched what was going on and said, who are you? You're a stranger in town. And he started talking to him. They had a great conversation. Well, Edson and his friend, I think it was George, found out that Goodloe is a teacher. They said, would you teach us? Now, I, I tease with some young people that I know. I'm not going to look at them right now because you might guess who I'm talking about. But um, sometimes we don't look forward to education. But in those days, we wanted education. They desperately wanted. So they begged him, and soon Goodloe started teaching. In the evenings, in the summertime there, in 1868, he started teaching 12 students. Two of them were the white boys, Edson and Willie, and two were the Kellogg boys. One eventually became the Cornflake King, and the other one became John Harvey Kellogg. So what a prestigious first class being taught there in 1868. Um, it got so well that people more wanted to join. So in that fall, they soon had a full school going with Mr. Goodloe Bell. Great story. Um, yes, so that is the, the, the beginning. We're going to come to what took place next. There was uh, a lady by the name of Ellen White had a vision concerning education. Direction on how to be effective in training young people for God. And the counsel she gave in 1872 was very similar to what I'm sharing with you about Pestalozza and Oberlin and some others. It needs to be holistic. There needs to be a training of the physical and the mental and the spiritual. And anytime you read anywhere about these in Adventist literature, you're going to find it in that order. The physical and the mental and the spiritual. And the reason is, is because Adventist education puts physical first, historically. 
Because a healthy mind, a healthy body, produces a healthy mind, which then can communicate with God. I used to say, why spiritual last? Shouldn't spiritual be first? Actually, it takes a healthy body and a healthy mind to connect with God. Yes, God can reach us no matter how bad our mind is. Amen? But there is benefits to having a healthy body, and that was important, a very key priority. Um, next was health training to, was to be first. You know who the first health teachers are supposed to be in Seventh-day Adventist education? The first health teachers are parents. In fact, I read somewhere the first thing would be anatomy and physiology. I thought, that's a little bit rough. So I tease my daughter every now and then. These are your phalanges, right? But we, that's not really what was being discussed. It's knowing your body and knowing how to take care of it. That was a key. This is Seventh-day Adventist education, knowing how to take care of yourself, how to be a healthy individual. Um, manual labor in schools was supposed to be important. Is there, this was also came up a lot, especially outside. I remember I went to an academy in Pennsylvania called Blue Mountain Academy. And it, in Blue Mountain, you had to work a minimum of two hours a day. It's based upon this concept. By the way, what does work have to do with education? So let me ask you, flip it around. Why are you being educated? Most of you are being educated so that you could someday work, right? And so the education is supposed to be beneficial to your work. But is work itself education? I remember my father teaching me how to shovel manure. There are, yes, Theo, you're right. There's a way to shovel and there's a way not to shovel. And I was doing it this way. Some of you may laugh because you know how to use shovels. I didn't know how to use a shovel when I first started. So I take my shovel, I take the end of the shovel and I push it like this and then I try to lift it up and move it. Ridiculous. My dad said, son, you grab it here and you grab it here. You lean it like this and you slide in and let your whole body dig for you. That way you don't have to use your arms as much and you'll last a whole lot longer. I hope, I hope that wasn't new for any of you. But that was education. Does that make sense? So work can be an education because later on in life you use it. Anything that you're going to help be a better person. And so that was what the mindset of Adventist education. And the last one here was thorough Bible study. Uh, moral intellectual and physical culture should be combined in order to have a well-developed well-balanced men and women um, not only is god worried about our minds he's worried about our spiritual and also our physical how we do things so this is adventist this is a picture of adventist council at that time well battle creek college was the first college that was started 1874 the general conference heard about the council in 1872 72, and they said we need to start a school hmm what are we going to do let's look for someone to teach who was already teaching there what was the name of that guy the guy with the big beard oh boy teachers should never do this but i do it anyhow because that's what i want i want you to actually get it good low bell g-o-o-d good l-o-e good low and his last name was bell you want to call him professor bell you're safe so Goodlow Bell, I would think that you would choose Goodlow, but they don't choose Professor Bell. You know why? He doesn't have a degree. He went to Oberlin. Oberlin didn't have any degrees. And so they said, we got to look for somebody else. And they looked around and they found a guy named Sidney. Sidney Brownsburger. But before I get to Sidney Brownsburger, Goodlow Bell, by the way, at this time, was already teaching in a multi-grade elementary school and academy. Slight parenthetical statement is it better to have a multi-grade school or a single grade school who votes for single grade don't raise your hand who votes for multi-grade you can raise your hand now okay multi-grade education has shown over and over again to be better for the academics without a question and for the social life there is no question if you want to see a better education do multi-grade now, I didn't realize that. I kind of wish that everyone was fifth graders when I was in fifth grade and everyone was sixth graders when I was in sixth grade. But I realized when I was in eighth grade, I was the substitute teacher. When the teacher for first through grade three didn't show up, they asked me to go teach. 
oh, and you say, well, that's kind of poor, but what it did is it helped them. They actually learn better from me sometimes. You know why? I'm highly motivating. Finish your math assignment, we go out to recess. But what if we finish in 10 minutes? That's okay. We get extra long recess. It, it was motivating. But I also learned how to relate to different people. They learned. Everyone benefited. I couldn't do well at certain things. I had friends who taught me. We work together, and, and it's, it's uh, statistically proven. Multi-grade schools. Okay, that was my parenthetical statement. Back off a bit. Okay. Um, the college was started in 1874 with 12 students, quickly reached about 100. The first years were interesting. We had Sidney Brownsberger. He was a, a very honest man. He had a master's degree. He actually was in, in charge of huge districts in Michigan of schools. Uh, he was a very gifted educator. But his education was what you and I would now call classical education. So he had specialized in Greek classics, Latin classics. Uh, he knew a lot about classics and very little about this educational reform, shall I call it that? This idea of doing education a different way. And so um, they started him out as president underneath James White. And the reason they had James White be the president is in those days, everything James White did worked. So they said, well, don't we might have to give him something else to do. You know, there's a saying, if a guy... Uh, find a man who's doing a lot and give him more to do and he'll do it well. Uh, I, that backfired on James White, but um, they put him in charge and that's what happened. Um, Bell was not chosen because if he didn't have a degree, but quite frankly, Bell understood it. Uh, he was the one who was best prepared at that point. Um, the location they chose, I, I hear first years and have difficulties. I'm going to get to the difficulties, but first years, the location according to, okay, if work is supposed to be part of it, or do you need a little property or a big property? You need a big property, especially if agriculture is going to be part of that work, which was often was pushed at that time. You have to remember, in 1874, how much of the United States was agriculture? 90% of the people lived on farms. Okay? Uh, by the time you got to the early 1900s, 10%. And now it's less than a percent, if I remember correctly. So there's been a major shift. So you were training people for practical work. You're going to train them how to work on a farm. That makes sense, right? You're going to train them how to work with bees. You're going to train them how to work with cows. You're going to train them how to work with poultry. You're going to train them how to work in growing food. It was a very big thing. And so that's what was being done. All right. Um, so there was council, get a lot of acreage. There was a fairs ground right outside of Battle Creek. Had 50 acre fairground. Um, Ellen White was part of the team, and she said, you need to get that. Then she and her husband went for a trip, and a guy out there said, you know what? One of the men on the board said, that's just a long walk from the Battle Creek Sanitarium, the Western Health Reform Institute, I think is what it was then. It's a long, I mean, it's a, it's a long distance. You and I will smile. It was, it, was, it was a long city block. They said, that's too far away. We need to get it closer. So they bought property, which was right on the, across the street, from the sanitarium. Seven acres were 12 acres. They sold all five acres and had seven, seven acres left over. Um, there was no Bible classes. Actually, there was one Bible class. Uh, it was, written, it was uh, given by a guy named Uriah Smith. Does that ring a bell to any of you? So Uriah Smith, we know him as writing a book called Dan and Revelation. Well, he was the first Bible teacher. And uh, 50, one-fifth of the students actually attended his class. 80% never went to Bible class. So here is a Seventh-day Adventist college, no work study, no Bible class. I mean, it's, it's optional. You don't have to go if you don't want to go. It didn't sound very much like what you and I are, are used to. Um, industries, which was a big issue, training not just the head but also the hand, was not taking place. So um, it got difficult for a while. Sidney Brownsberger said, I don't have what it takes. I knew this all along. In fact, he was an honest man. From the very beginning, he said, I don't know what you're talking about with this education reform. I don't think I can do it. I can imagine Bell saying, I got it. But they said, no, that's okay. You can try, Sidney. We like you. You're a good guy. Sidney tried and wasn't able to do so. I got good news for you. Sidney was moved to another state after this happened. It was called California. And that time he started it out with everything that he missed in Battle Creek and did a fantastic job. By the way, the school he started in California was called, it was in Healdsburg. We now call it Pacific Union College. So he, is, he was the founder of that. Okay. In fact, I think I jumped ahead of myself. There it is. Uh, and that was in 1882. Um, before 
uh, Brownsburg, after Brownsburger left to Healdsburg College, they got in another, another teacher. He was not an Adventist, but he had a degree. So they said, we'll make him the president, even though he doesn't, uh, because degrees, degrees are, have their importance. You and I realize that. And if you have a degree here, know that you worked hard for it and it taught you a lot of things. But sometimes degrees don't make the person. Isn't that right? You, you need quite a things come together. And so they brought in another guy. He started a whole separation on campus. And soon at Battle Creek College, you may not have known this, was split down the center. Half the people supported Professor Bell. And the other half supported the new principal, the new president. And you know what the split was over? Theology. Interesting enough, they hired a president who did not have the same beliefs. And so he split the school theologically. Instantly, the leadership said, you know what? We're closing down the school for a year to regroup. Brownsburger was doing great in Hillsburg College. And then they had a place called South Lancaster Academy. Do you know where that's at? I hope so. And South Lancaster Academy, they had a guy go and start it. And this was in 1882. So the first two colleges outside of what is now Andrews University was Healdsburg College, Pacific Union College, and AUC, South Lancaster Academy. Uh, the first teacher, the first president, was Professor Bell. Professor Bell, who knew what he was doing all along, came out to the east, Massachusetts, and started South Lancaster Academy. And his Bible teacher was a guy named Stephen Haskell. S.N. Haskell. So that, can you imagine, you have Battle Creek with Uriah Smith, and you have S.N. Haskell at AUC. Sometimes I just want to go back in time. But we can't. We've got to enjoy the days we're in right now. Then Union College was started. Union was started in 1891. 1892, Walla Walla was started. Both of them were started by a guy named W.W. W. Prescott. And both of them, Healdsburg College, actually all of them, Healdsburg College, South Lancaster Academy, Union College, and Walla Walla, all started out with two strong emphasis. We are religious schools, and we're going to have Bible classes and focus on religion. And we're going to have industries where people can learn how to work. So that was the focus in those, those uh, schools in the early days. Another one was started, Graysville Academy, which later became SAU, or Southern Adventist University. Um, then another one, American Medical Missionary College, was started by John Harvey College after Battle Creek closed. And that was in 1895. And then one was started in North London, a training school for Bible workers, and then Keene Industrial School was started in Texas, Southwestern Adventist Uni University. So a lot of schools, this is the 1890s, everything is popping, everything is growing, and this is the time of colleges starting everywhere. Claremont Union College was started in South Africa. Um, Avondale in Australia. By the way, Avondale used to be another school. It was a college that started in Melbourne, and after five years, they said, we want to move out in the country and follow this council of having uh, uh, work education combined with intellectual education. And so they moved out to Avondale now. Uh, Oakwood Industrial School was started in 1896. In fact, the president of the General Conference actually is the one who went and helped break ground for Oakwood Industrial School. And then Emmanuel Missionary College. You'll say, wait, Emmanuel Missionary College? I've never heard of it. Or maybe you did hear of it. It used to be Battle Creek, but then it became Emmanuel Missionary College before it became Andrews. I'd like to just touch on it just a little bit as we go into it. The Battle Creek College had some years of growth and change. W.W. Prescott was the president for quite a while. Prescott was interesting in some ways. Uh, he, he, he promoted industries and Bible classes the whole way across the board, which is the hallmark of Seventh-day Adventist education. Okay, so before I go too much further, I want to just emphasize this. This book is decidedly Christian. You can't, I mean, it's, it, the, it talks about Christ the whole way through it. There are countries that are not Christian countries who set up their educational systems based upon the principles in this book. You can find it in the South Pacific and quite a few different countries. Why? Because it has been proven over and over again that this kind of teaching where you combine intellect and work together 
without an overworking of either produces the best results. People see it over and over again. So um, I have no shame in saying if you haven't read it and you're interested in education, this is the place to go. Um, it is without a question. So W.W. W. Prescott, back to Battle Creek, he was promoting this, this union of industries and Bible classes. Um, he was, however, really hadn't done some of the reforms that were being pushed. Uh, if any of you went to an Adventist college or academy, you may remember that it was predominantly vegetarian, especially if you're here in the U.S. Uh, some of my friends who are in other countries say it's not that way there, and I understand. But here in the U.S., it's predominantly been vegetarian. Well, it wasn't that way during Prescott, except there was a guy by the name of Sutherland. Edward Sutherland was a Bible teacher. And Sutherland was, he was a rabble riser, just a little bit. He was, in, he was willing to be cutting edge. He read and said, I saw what's happened in Avondale. This is a little bit later. I've gotten ahead of myself. But he wanted to be, let, let's, let's, let's be uh, ahead of the game. Let's not be the tail. Let's be the head, so to speak, when it comes to education. And so Edward Sutherland started teaching his students, here's the way we're supposed to live. Here's how to have good health. And you know what Sutherland started doing? I mean, you know what his students started doing? His students started pressuring the president. And so the Prescott started changing things because of what Sutherland's students were telling him to do. So this was, uh, if you want to change society, change the colleges. If you want to change society, change colleges. If you've been shocked at what's taking place in our country in the last 15 to 20 years, look at your colleges. The colleges of the United States are producing the fruit that we see today. It's a true story. And so we are becoming the fruit of our educational system. Uh, society reflects its education. And the way we train our youth, the way we train our colleges, is the way our nation will be. Education determines the future of our society. Um, so, Cavanis uh, was the next president after W. w. Prescott. Prescott moved on because he was starting schools everywhere. Cavanis became the next president. It got so bad at one point that uh, Ellen White said during Cavanis' presidency, uh, I don't suggest you go to Battle Creek for school. That was kind of a, a cutting remark at that point. Um, and then Sutherland came in. Now, Sutherland, again, was a little bit of a revolutionary. Uh, by the way, revolutionaries connect well with colleges. Have you ever noticed that? I found that it's a good thing. I, I like to be a little revolutionary at times myself. And in teaching, you're allowed to be a little bit more revolutionary than as a pastor. Have you realized that? You have to be a little bit careful. But when you're a teacher, I have seen teachers do things. You're like, how can I get away with that? They're a teacher. And because of that, teachers have the power to change in an incredible way. My hat's off the teachers. Sutherland said, here's what we need to do. Let's move out of our seven acres in Battle Creek and let's get property. And so they moved to a place called Bering Springs, Michigan. Um, so they had a new location. They gave it a new name, Emmanuel Missionary College. And they gave it a new focus. Degrees in classics were out. And this is a whole other study which I won't get into and it's highly debatable. I'm just telling you what happened. We're giving you a history here. Manual labor and outreach came in. One went out, one came in. They got rid of sports. They said, we won't want to have any sports. We want to have focus on manual labor. And to make it crystal clear, Sutherland grabbed the plow with his assistant, P.T. McGann, Piercy McGann, and one of the heavier teachers put them on the plow to dig in, and they plowed up the sports field and said, we're planting a garden. So if you're wondering how Southern was, he was dramatic, and he was making things happen in Berrien Springs. There's something else he did that was, I would like to really focus on, is Sutherland said, we need education desperately. Education is the future of our church. There were six Adventist elementary schools, Six. I'm not talking about in Bering Springs. I'm talking about in North America. At least that's what we can see at this time. And he said, we're going to change that. You know what he did? He trained all the teachers inside Emmanuel Missionary Institute and said, your goal is to go out and start a school. Every single church should have a school. Every single church should have a school. Let's make it happen. And so I praise God for a place like Cape Cod Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
who says, we are going to have a school for our young people no matter what. And by the way, I've sat on the board and I heard that, no matter what. That's what's going to take place. And that's the mindset. That's the, that's the spirit of Seventh-day Adventist education. It went from six schools to 150 Adventist schools just in a few years. Because there was a determination, we are going to start Adventist education. I'd like to bring out a point at this point. And by the way, that picture is E.A. Sutherland at the time he was doing all of his uh, teaching when he was beginning. He's a young guy, as you can see, minus the beard of Goodloe Bell. Um, but again, an educator. There's a statement in the book Education, page 18, that says that education is to give the power to young people to think and to act. Are you ready? Power to think and to act. And then it says this, so that we are masters and not slaves of our circumstances. That is what education should be training us to do. Something else it should, should prepare us for service, and we see that here. Okay, I'd like to go to the challenge of today. The first 40 years of Adventist education saw the seeds of Christian education being spread all around the world. You saw the schools where they were starting up. Um, just in a few years, we went from six to 150 elementary schools, and it kept exploding. Uh, we had a college on almost every single continent uh, in the world. What's the challenge today? I, I, you know, I would prefer to ask one of our teachers to come up and share this part, but since you're not prepared... I'm sure you could do it better even without preparation, but I'm going to share a few things here. The challenge today in Adventist education is big. It's not bigger than God, but it's a big, it's a big challenge. One challenge is this, government involvement. How much do I want to be involved? Uh, how much do I want uh, the government to be involved with our educational system? You say, well, we don't have much of that. Well, you do in some degree. Um, how do we do our accreditation? Do we have our accreditation via a church body, which I praise God we have that ability, or do we have our accreditation via a public school setting? Here in North America, we have some advantages, but we don't have these advantages in maybe other parts of our world. Another thing that's a challenge for us today is Bible-based education versus a secular focus. Is your curriculum going to be Bible-based, or is your curriculum going to be public school-based? You say, Chuck, that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, how I went through Adventist Elementary School and we had Adventist readers, Adventist science, Adventist Bible. But I think if I remember right, at least in my years, everything else was public school curriculum. I praise God for Adventist science. Uh, that was a key, a very big key at that time. The next one, and this is one that uh, can't be changed, I don't think, by the school. I think this is, can be changed only at the home. And I'm, I'm coming to the close. This is the final section here. So uh, this is, um, uh, let's not miss this part. Mission focus versus career focus. What is your focus? What is our young people's focus? Are we training them to get great careers? Because if that's the only thing we're doing, we're failing in our Seventh-day Adventist educational system. I don't think the system's failing. But I think we're failing sometimes as a church as a whole. We have motivated careers and jobs so high that the spiritual life has taken second place. Is it good to be able to get a job? Absolutely. I'm working on a master's degree. I think it's important. I want to be clear that I'm not cutting it down. But what I'm saying is if we become career focused instead of mission focused, there's a problem. Loma Linda University used to be entitled the College of Medical Evangelists. The purpose was always in front of you. Yes, you're a doctor, but you're also an evangelist. Don't forget it. Your job is not to go out and become rich. Your job is to go out and use your gifts for the purpose of God's work. I praise God I see it in this church and I see it in other churches as well. But there is a lot sometimes where we forget that. What is our focus? Is your focus to get a job and just sustain life? That's not Adventist education. Adventist education realizes that we exist for the purpose of sharing the message of a soon-coming Savior with the entire world. 
That's why we exist. We exist because there's people that are hurting, people who, are, who don't have hope, and we can give them hope. We can give them hope as engineers. Amen? We can give them hope as scientists. We can give them hope as medical workers. We can give them hope as agricultural workers. We can give them hope as people who work in law or anywhere else. We give people hope. Our job is simply the way that we carry out our mission. We can't lose sight of that. If we do, Adventist education will fall apart. We, as parents, as grandparents, have a responsibility to change the thinking of our church, to not be career-focused. I'm not saying everyone is, but it's a strong force. We need to become mission focus. And then this last one is Adventist education versus public education. All right, so this is where the rubber hits the road a little bit. Um, public education is free. Adventist education is not. And you get what you pay for. You say, Chuck, what are you saying? That's, that's, those are harsh words. I remember my father distinctly saying, my son, if I have to live on bread and water, my son is going to go to an Adventist elementary school. I said, whoa. I knew what it was like for us to struggle financially. I knew it. But I knew that it happened because my father and my mother were going to do whatever it took for me to go to Adventist school. Why? Because they wanted to give me the advantage, every advantage they could spiritually. It was hard. You know, I went to school a few years ago. Not as long as some of you, but it's been a few years ago. 30 years ago, I started academy. And 30 years ago, when I started academy, you know what it cost per month for me as a day student? About $400 to $500 a month. As a day student, my friends who were actually in school, in the dorm, especially the guys who ate at the cafeteria, they were doing about 1000 a month 30 years ago. You know that your economy doubles every 30 years. You realize that? Inflation, excuse me. And so right now, I would assume it's probably around 2000 a month if you're a day student in academy. I mean, a, a, a dorm student in academy and probably close to $800 to $1,000 as a day student. That's a lot of money. Now, I worked as hard as I could to help pay that off because that was part of the Adventist system. Work study. I want to encourage you. Education is not just information. It's not just here. Education is everything that you are. And Adventist education is focused on that. We need that more than we've ever needed it before. We need Adventist education that's holistic, mind, body, heart. We need that now more than we've ever needed it. You know, it's time for us, I believe, to support true education. And I think I'm trying to, could someone forward the slide to our final slide? My clicker stopped working. I think it's time for us to support true education. We need to be investing in Christian education with our children, with our time, with our finances. For those who are, your sacrifice will be measured in heaven. I am sure of that. For those of us who are not, it's time to put God's principles to the test. We need to make Christian education for ourselves and for our children a priority. There's a story that I heard a friend of mine teach, tell, and it was about two dogs. And here's how he put it. It's an illustration. He says, let's say you have two dogs. You have one dog over here, and they're both huskies. We'll use, the, we'll use the husky, okay? And they're both the same size, came from the same litter, strong, powerful dogs. And I have one dog here, and I have one dog here. Let's say that this dog, I feed him with the premier 
dog food. I give him the best water. I make sure he gets all the exercise that he can possibly get. And this one over here, I have the cheapest dog food I can get. I leave him chained up all the time. You know what? I might as well save some money and cut his dog food in half. Which dog is going to be stronger? Help me out. Which dog is going to be stronger? Here. If you want to see success with our youth, we need to feed them right. Don't give them the refuse of public thinking. We need to feed them right. We need to exercise them right. Now more than ever. I know this has been a little intense. I'm sorry. I love Christian education. Uh, this book also says this. Page 30. The work of education and the work of redemption are one. Let's focus. Let's make that a priority. Praise God for the work that we see in our community. I praise God for Bayberry School. I want to just give a shout out again. Our teachers are all sitting in the same row today. Praise God for the work of Bayberry School. But I also praise God for the many other schools, for the academies that are, are doing the very best they can at the time we're living in. Let us pray. Father in heaven, our, our minds have been challenged in this history of your, your work in education. We want our youth to be strong as possible. Let us focus on what gives strength. Give us courage, Father, as individuals and as a church. We thank you, Father, for your love. We pray that you would be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.